going on, based on the world. This video is going to be a little bit different than what you guys are used to. This story is pretty much on Dwayne Pintoff and how he spent his 30 years in the search of Sasquatch and why a man would dedicate most of his life to just searching this creature that most people don't, don't even believe exists. That says a lot. It speaks volumes. But uh, this, these articles are very interesting. I have three different articles. The first article I'm going to jump into is how I became interested in cryptic research. Hopefully I don't butcher this up too much with my reading, but uh, it's definitely a fascinating story. We'll get through it, guys. It's definitely a great story. Alright. <coughs> Here we go, guys. I've had a fascination with the creature known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch since I was a kid in the 70s. I can remember watching the Gremlin Patterson documentary in the theater and thinking, wow, wouldn't it be cool to see something like that in the woods? A couple of years later, I went to the theater to see The Legend of Boggy Creek, and at the time I watched the movie, it scared the crap out of me. But I figured that most of what I was but I figured that most of what was in the movie was only make-believe boogeyman stuff. Never did I realize that these creatures actually exist all over the U.S. and around the world. It wasn't until 1983 that I became a true believer and began my quest to find the proof of the existence. After a family member had close to face-to-face -face encounter with one of these creatures near the swamps of Lake in South Carolina. This report has been posted in the BFRO website, South Carolina, Kershaw County. In August of 1983, my middle brother's father-in-law, Brady, and I were both working on a modification project at the International Paper Plant in Georgetown, South Carolina. At the time, we both lived in Spartansburg, South Carolina, about three hours north of our work location. Brady was working as a union pipe fitter and I was working as a process control engineer. Because we had a different work schedules, we were unable to commute to our homes together on our days off. The story I'm about to share was told to me by Brady when he returned to work on the following Monday morning. Brady came to my work area before we started work telling me that we needed to talk. First he asked if he if I had driven home from the for the weekend because he knew that we both drove the same roads from work to home. Then he proceeded to tell me about encountering something on the previous Friday night that he said would change his life forever. Brady told me that it had been raining earlier in the day creating ground mist as he was driving through the Kershaw County on the isolated stretch of Highway 97 around 10.30 p.m. There was very little traffic on the road. He said he came up suddenly. He came up behind a car that he decided to follow for a couple of miles. As he followed this car, he said it suddenly swerved and skidded off the side of the road. He did not know what happened due to the road was unusually straight in this location. He had he at the time was a volunteer rescue worker and thought someone might need medical assistance. He told me that he pulled his truck off the edge of the road and went to see if anyone was hurt. He found two elderly ladies in the car, quite shaken up but unhurt. They were very exi excited and frantic frantically kept asking him, did you see it? Did you see it? He told, he told me that he did not know at the moment what they were talking about and continued to ask if either of them were hurt. They said no and proceeded to tell the, him that a deer first crossed the road in front of him and then a large black creature almost ran into their car. They said that that's when they swerved to avoid hitting whatever it was. He said that he pretty much ignored what they were saying since he hadn't seen anything. He told them he had some rope and would be glad to pull their car onto the road with his truck. As he walked around to the back of his truck to get the, t 
to get the rip. He told me that's when he walked straight into whatever it was that these two ladies said was chasing the deer. Standing about 30 feet from the back of his truck, Brady said it looked to be over six feet tall, had dark, wet, long hair, and was much wider built than any man he knew. He told me that it smelled like rotting meat and that when he shined a flashlight at it, his eyes were as fiery red color as he was telling me about this. His voice was quivering and he was very emotional. He told me that he must have been in shock because he didn't know why, but he stood at his ground. Brady wasn't sure how long he stood there staring at this thing, but within minutes he said it turned and walked a short distance to the edge of the woods, then stopped again. It made a short, low growling noise, then it slowly turned and walked into the woods. He told me that he could hear it breaking branches or trees as it walked away, although he had just witnessed something that he couldn't describe. He told me that he was still able to help the ladies with their car without even telling them what he had seen behind his truck. After he got back into the truck, he told me that he must have, it must have been when he realized what he experienced because he was, uh, he said that he started, wait, what? Able to help the ladies with their car without even telling them what he just had seen behind the truck. After he got back into his truck, he told me that must have been when he realized what he had experienced because he said he started shaking uncontrollably and took him several minutes to calm down so that he could continue to drive home. I could tell whatever he said I could tell whatever he had seen truly upset him. He was an emotional telling he was very emotional telling me about his encounter, which has stuck in my mind ever since. To my knowledge, Brady has never told anyone else about this, at least not anyone in our family, as far as I know. In 1984, I relocated to Columbia, South Carolina, and had an opportunity to return to the location of Brady's encounter. What I realized when I was investigating the area was that what Brady thought was over six feet tall was most likely closer to nine feet tall. In his state of emotion, and with it very dark, he had not taken into account that he was standing on the edge of the road and the creature would have been standing at the bottom of the embankment, which was roughly three to four feet in difference in elevation. I spent several weekends hiking around the swamp and woods of Lake Wadabee, um, Poinsettia State Park and other wooded areas east of Columbia, South Carolina, in hopes of finding some kind of evidence that the creature would, uh, that the creature that Brady claimed to have seen that night was in fact real. Unfortunately, I never found any supporting evidence. In 1986, I was offered a one-year assignment in the field engineer at a low, at the now closed Trojan, Trojan Nuclear Station in Rainer, Oregon. Um, being an avid hiker and having a zest for the outdoors, I accepted the job within the hopes of exploring the big woods of Pacific Nor Northwest. Um, you have to remember, this is, let me fix this. This is before the internet, so the term Bigfoot wasn't exactly a household word at the time. So I wasn't connecting so I wasn't connecting this location and Bigfoot together, even though I had been searching for clues in the woods back in South Carolina. However, that all changed shortly after I arrived at my new destination. Over the few months after arriving in my new location, I hiked the Dallas in the Columbia River, Georgia. Columbia River Gorge and a couple of trails in the Olympic National Forest because it had been only six years following the eruption of Mount St. Helens. I thought it would be interesting to check out the location as well. I was told that I could hike 
in as close as two miles to the red zone, which was close enough to get some nice pictures of the volcano. Never did I realize that I would get an education in Bigfoot that day on the way to the trailhead on Highway 504. As I was driving, I was surprised to see this 20 to 30 foot tall carved statue of Bigfoot standing in the parking lot of a souvenir shop. If not for the Bigfoot statue, I probably would have never, I would probably would have just driven by, figuring it to be just another tourist trap. For outsiders like myself, boy, am I ever glad that I stopped to check it out. Not only was the statue fun to see, but the proprietor owner of the gift shop had all had water wall display cases filled with dozens of Bigfoot tracks, cast hair samples, multiple newspaper write ups, Indian artifacts depicting Bigfoot and several other Bigfoot related items. If I remember correctly, I think I paid a dollar to enter the area with this this display. As it turned out, it was worth that and more. As I'm walking around looking at everything, the owner asked me where I was from and if I had heard of Bigfoot. I told him that I had seen a I had seen the Gremlin Patterson documentary in Legend of Boggy Creek back in the seventies and I shared my story about the Bigfoot encounter my brother father in law had in nineteen eighty three that had intrigued me to start searching for them. Again, this is pre internet and I had no contact with anyone at this time. He shared my belief. So I was rather clueless about the decades of Bigfoot sightings associated with Mount St. Helens, Washington State, Oregon, how the Native American Indians of the region interacted with these creatures they called the wild man or hairy apes or the legend of Ape Canyon. He's right. Um, what I thought was going to be a 10 or 15 minute stop turned into a couple of hours of Bigfoot 101. I was, I only wish that I could have had a tape recorder so I would have been able to have captured all the conversations we had that day. As I'm about to leave a young guy named James or Jason who had been in the shop and had joined in the conversation asked me if I would be interested in flying up to the mouth of the volcano and take pictures. He introduced himself and told me that he was a pilot and had a helicopter parked up the road. Only fifty dollars to have a chance to look down into the active volcano. No way was I passing that chance up. So we both drove up the road about a mile and there setting on the concrete pad is a sleek looking blue and silver helicopter. That's what's up. I quickly realized I was going to be the only passenger, which was really cool. We were chatting as we took off, and I soon learned that my pilot was a retired military chopper pilot who had flown missions in Vietnam. After retiring the Army, he told me that he decided to buy the helicopter and fly tourists up to see Mount St. Helens and Spirit Lake. He told me he also transported geologists up to the observatory. Johnson's Observatory, where they perform, perform seismic analysts. During our flight, we spotted a sizable herd of elk gazing just outside the red zone, where vegetation began to grow again. He has a picture of the herd of elk out there. It's kind of decent. But seeing how easy they were to spot from the chopper, I jokingly asked if he had ever seen a Bigfoot while flying in this area. He surprised me when he said, yeah, I have. He said that he, he had spotted a couple of them and that they didn't seem to be afraid of the helicopter. He then told me his story about how after the eruption, had, he had witnessed an Army Corp of Engineers transport choppers using large cargo nets to haul away the remains of dead elk and other indigenous animals that were killed by the flood or burned. Then he became very serious and told me that what he told me next I couldn't repeat. 
He told me that he had also witnessed what looked like a burned bodies of two large hair covered creatures being hauled away in these cargo nets. He said that he only saw the leg with foot and arm hands all covered with dark hair. He the arm and leg were very large and bulky as compared to a person. The story fascinated me and I really didn't know whether to believe him or not. We continued talking as we approached the volcano for a few minutes through. I have to admit I forgot about the Bigfoot story as I peered out of the window into the mouth of hell itself. And he does got some fascinating pictures of the mouth of Mount St. Helens. But as we were flying away from the volcano, I started asking more questions about the bodies and asked what, what else happened. That's when he surprised me by asking me if I wanted to see where the bodies were airlifted in the cargo nets. Next photo shows the location, although the report reports found online that the bodies were found. Although the reports found online states that the bodies were found while dredging the Cowerlitz, Cower, Cowerlitz River, they were actually airlifted out where Spirit Lake spills into the North Fork Tottle River Basin. I know I butchered that up. But he's got like a picture of both spots in the arrow going to the actual cargo net spot where they was getting airlifted up. <laughs> but as we were flying to the location where this allegedly happened, he continued telling me that he had told what he witnessed to a reporter from Kelso newspaper. He said that soon after his story was posted, he received a visit by two men who only identified themselves as government employees. They told him that if he did not retract his story, that he would risk having his pilot license revoked. I learned through online research that they also threatened to stop his military pension. I guess he must have agreed to their terms since he was still flying. When I was there, and thankfully he was still discreetly telling his story in certain people in con confidence, in 1999, after the internet was born, while browsing for Bigfoot stories and reports, I came across an article and was amazed to read the story about Bigfoot bodies being removed. I've heard that same story. It's a fascinating story. And about a helicopter pilot, whom I believe was the same pilot I had met back in 1986, who had claimed to have witnessed this event. In further research, I found information online that this pilot was a decorated war veteran and that he had passed away in 2008 due to cancer. I am happy to that I took the time that day to stop at that gift shop and that I had the privilege to meet this noteworthy person. My interest was renewed following my encounter with the pilot for the remainder of the time that I spent living in the work living and working in Washington State, Oregon, I had the opportunity to hike and hide horses and ride horses along the set several of trails in both Washington and Northern Oregon looking for Bigfoot and enjoying the great Northeast Northwest. Although I did not have a Bigfoot encounter, it has remained one of the greatest experiences of my life. It is a beautiful area. Upon rem Upon my return to South Carolina in 1987, I continued my search for Bigfoot while hiking along the Appalachian Trails and Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. No evidence was ever found. From 1987 and until at least 1995, I sort of put my Bigfoot research aside to pursue other interests. Since moving to Southwest P Southwestern PA in 1992, I have hiked miles of wooded trails in Allegheny, Westmoreland, Somerset, Fed, Beaver, and Clearfield counties in 1999 after the internet began to grow. I decided to do a Google search for Bigfoot research in Pennsylvania, and thanks to groups like the BFRO, Gulf Coast 
Bigfoot Research Org and Bigfoot Research Network in Ohio. You said a mouthful with them names, but um, no comment. In Ohio, I was able to find several historical and current Bigfoot reports from nearby location. This reignited my interest, and since that time, I have resumed my field research. I have had several close encounters, rock throwing, heard loud screams, had something charge us, and make thou would not, heard something very heavy running away on two feet, etc. All at close proximity, but ne have never actually seen a physical creature. During my time in the woods, I have found several large humanoid-like footprints and multiple tree structures. I have invested a lot of time and money into this research and will continue to do the research as long as I am physically able. The search continues. I told you guys, that's a fascinating story, and it just started. My apologies for butchering up some of these words, but for the most part, this story is definitely getting out. It's fascinating, and that's just the first part, guys. Okay, guys, before I get into this next part, some crazy shit just happened. I want to let you guys know. Um, right after I read that first story of the Wayne Pinto, I hit stop so I can refresh my coffee and get, get situated here. But as I was doing that, as soon as I hit stop on the camera, I got my coffee, I sat back down here, my lighter on my desk started, well, it rolled over and it started rocking. Next day I know the camera, it turned like this, it turned, and this is what I end up seeing, these two pictures here. My camera stopped on these two pictures. I had to pretty much turn it back like this, so you guys can see the fan wall. It, it shook me. It shook me because that was like a lot at one time. That kind of scared me a little bit. But uh, I went back and checked it out to see it on the video, me telling the story to see if it happened while I was like filming, but it didn't. As soon as I hit the, it, it must have, the camera must have turned while I was getting coffee because I came back on. I turned the camera on and it was facing this picture already i didn't see the camera physically turn it so it had to turn when i went to go get the coffee but i physically seen the lighter like roll over and rock side to side and i went to hit the uh record button on on the camera that's when i noticed that the camera is facing them two pictures on the wall it is it is early, early in the morning, but uh, if you guys see anything or hear anything, let me know. But this next story, guys, is pretty much like some of Dwayne's act, some of Dwayne's experiences that he had out in the forest, and uh, I think he's back in my area. He is back in my area. This is actually um, Forbes State Forest that he had this encounter but this report was Friday August the 2015 the occurrence took place in Quebec run wild area in PA in Forbes State Forest along the Chestnut Ridge Mountains which is very fast very it's a large large forest dark forest at that you guys know about Forbes state forest um in Fayette county erica and i met up at this location to follow up on recent alleged bigfoot report i've had a few interactions up there myself we arrived in the late evening while still while still the daylight to scope out the location our intentions were to do night investigation with hopes of encountering a creature to make his presence known to us before dark we were visited by two Department of National Resource Conservation officers out on the evening patrol. We ended up having a 45-minute conversation regarding the possibility of cryptid creatures inhabiting the region of southwestern PA. Both officers were surprisingly open 
to the idea but admitted that they had never seen a creature or received any reports of strange creatures in their assigned location. After the DNC, DNRC officers left just prior to dark, a family of four showed up and told us that they were going to be camping about a mile from our location along the Big Sandy Creek and Mill Run Trail. After the family was out of sight, the woods became extremely quiet except for crickets, frogs, and occasional howl of coyotes in the distance. Guys, you remember them coyotes. <laughs> That was my last trip out there, I think, or a hoot from a board owl. Eric and I were sitting and listening, hoping to hear something walk, walking or maybe even make a tree knock or how nothing unusual happened within the first <coughs> within the first hour that could be contributed to Bigfoot, but the night was still young and would soon become interesting. Darkness set in early in the woods. This was a moonless night and void of residual light. In fact, the, as darkness continued, we realized that we couldn't even see each other setting within a few feet of each other without the support of a flashlight. Around 9 p.m., getting bored, I decided to do a wood knock to see if just maybe we might get response. When I walked over, to one of the large trees on the other side of the access road. Off in the far distance, I could see a bright orange-red glow. It was about fist size. Thinking, no big deal. I didn't pay much attention at first, figuring it was probably a beacon light or a barn or silo in the distance. Since the family of four had told us that they were going to be camping along the Big Sandy Creek and had pointed in a di different direction. I figured that it wasn't them. After the wood knock, I went back to sit down to listen and wait. After several minutes went by, I got up and shuffled around. When I walked up to the tree and looked in the direction of what I first thought was a beacon light, I noticed that the light was now more round in shape and seemed to be a little larger in size appearing to have moved closer to our location. When I told Eric I was looking what I was looking at, he said it was probably a campfire or someone camping on the other on another ridge. I didn't agree but again disregarded whatever it was. Another couple of minutes and then I looked back at the direction and where I had seen the orange object, the object was gone. However, I immediately spot a maze yellow colored beam of light about a, f I figured to be about a hundred yards or more ahead of us to the left under a canopy of hemlock trees. When I mentioned what I was seeing to Eric, he attributed the light to possibly being someone with a flashlight walking in the woods, maybe looking for firewood or out of, out on a night hike possibly, but the light was more of a glow and not a flashlight beam. Eric said they could have be used they could be using a glow stick. Eric seemed disinterested in the light and said he was going to take a stroll on the other side of the access road loop. I stayed at the cars continuing to watch the glowing object. As I watched I could tell that the light was rectangular in shape and was moving in erratic patterns. As, as I watched, the rectangular object changed from a maze yellow to a blush white color. After several minutes, the rectangular shaped light moved out of the canopy of trees and back further into the less densely tree-lined areas. Moving along the ground and then suddenly moving up to into the tree branches 15 or 20 feet. This all happened in what I'm guessing was 10 or 15 minutes time span. As I'm watching the object, I heard Eric walking on the gravel. As he came back to where I was standing in the middle of the access road, I whispered back to him that the object was still there and doing some weird things. Since he had left and I uh, Eric and I stood side by side watching as the object continued moving in the trees. Within minutes, it appeared to be moving in our direction. 
from where we were now standing and watching it, we could see that it had changed back to the yellowish color and gone from being the shape of a rectangular object to the best I can describe as being what looked like two foot long guessing elongated objects. Think the Star of David with a pointed top, pointed sides, and a longer pointed bottom, like the cross. As it moved close, 60 feet was later measured to where we were standing. We could see that it was glowing, pulsating. Think lava lamp of the 70s and the color were changing from orange to yellowish to white yellowish. The bottom of the object moved in a snake-like motion. No sound was heard and it seemed to move effortlessly, sort of like a balloon but it definitely wasn't a balloon. As we watched it continue to move closer, Eric decided to shine its military-grade flashlight on the object to see what it would do. At that exact moment, Eric's beam of light hit up, lit up the object and trans, translucent, blush white, clear vortex of portal appeared in the mid-air in the darkness, the floating object glided into the opening and the door portal quickly closed, leaving the sparkling of electricity charged particles falling to the ground. That's amazing. We were left standing in the black darkness again, saying, what WTF was that? We stood in the road for several minutes as I recalled to Eric how the object had moved under the hemlock canopy then into the tree line where he saw it when he returned from his walk. We stood watching the woods, hoping that the object would reappear. After 10 or 15 minutes, we sat back down, recalling what we had just witnessed, me being the curious. I wanted to get a closer look. I wanted to get closer to it type talk. I wanted to get closer to it. Type talked Eric into, type talked Eric into walking with me over to the hemlock canopy so that we could see if the illuminator object left any clues behind, no burn marks or anything unusual was found around the trees. We stood there thirty or, or so minutes and then decided to walk back to the cars. Once back at the cars, we settled down and decided to return to our attention to Bigfoot. After a few minutes, I decided to try another wood knock, so I got up to walk over to the original tree where it all started, and far off in the distance in the same direction as before, I saw what looked like the red glow again. It came back. This time, I watched it without looking away. And as I watched, this object seemed to be moving. There was no wind, no night. There was no wind that night, and it became it becoming larger. I told Eric, it's back, and it's coming this way. As I'm watching the object, I told Eric he needed to be checking it out. Eric walked over to where I was standing, and together we watched it as it approached us. There's nobody at my house. And I'm hearing this with headphones on. These are soundproof. And I'm still hearing it, so I know you guys can hear whatever that is. Um, we could see it moving along until it came about what we guessed to be 100 yards or so in front of us. It was dark sunset orange, red set, and looked to be the size of a bowling ball or a basketball. That's about the same size of one we've seen, same thing. That distance, instead of going left toward the hemlock, as it is believed to, instead of going left toward the hemlocks, as it is believed he did the first time, this time it looked at it took a 90 degree turn to our right and slowly ascended a rock covered hillside following the terrain. We watched as it glided along the ground and 
then disappeared out of sight. At this moment, Eric said that he didn't feel comfortable being in the woods anymore and that he was leaving, so I gave him, I gave in and we all called it a night. What it was that we were watching, I have no logical answer, but it was interesting and very amazing. I don't believe that it was of this world. Regrettably, neither Eric nor I thought to grab a camera or I or a thermal camera to try and record the object for one thing because of the extreme darkness and believe the distance between us and the object. I didn't think that it would be recordable. Also, when things did start happening, I was too mesmerized by what I was watching to think about a camera. Also, I never expected things to progress to where they did or the object to move as close as, to us as it did. Over the past years, I have returned to this area for several daylight and night investigations. Unfortunately, none of the outings produced any further evidence of the 2015 event. Other researchers who I've spoken with have seen similar eliminated objects in the woods, but no one has witnessed a portal opening in midair. While discussing the event with Stan Gordon, local UFO researcher, historian, he told me that he had received at least half a dozen reports of people seeing similar objects across Pennsylvania at that time. I'm wondering if this extraterrestrial or military related is a mysterious anomaly for sure. That story is fascinating. And you know what? What's even more fascinating? I've um, I'm out of sight, but I've experienced that same sphere, that same object, that same ball of energy. Uh, there's a lot of researchers, uh, Bigfoot researchers out there in 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 the field that's out there doing footwork has experienced that same orb. I don't think it's related to anything to do with Sasquatch, but at the same time, there's something going on out there. What I do think it is related to, I, I do notice over the years, all the years I've been going out there, and I see it all the time. Um, in Sasquatch areas, if you notice, the briar bushes, the jagger bushes, they're all grazed down, they're all trimmed down. And it looks like the, where they're, they're clipped down to, the tips of them are burnt, like maybe an inch, half inch. The tips of them are bur burnt off or whatever. I'm not, I think, I'm thinking myself that there's there's something going on there. There's definitely something going on there. But that throws us into the third part of it, and that is all the sightings that he had. And I want to say, my location and Dwayne's location, more Dwayne's location because he has over 30 years experience in these woods, Moy land, Bigfoot land, the ravine, the maze, he knows the whole lay of that land a lot, a lot more, a lot better than I do, as you guys seen from my last outing with Dwayne. Okay, this third one here is on paper, so I'll be reading off of the script. <clears throat> it's a list of big, big uh, I'll get it out. It's a list of Bigfoot reports in in our area. Okay guys, we're going into the third series, which is paperback. All right, this is a list of reports in um, Bigfoot land, Moy land, that uh, in the ravine, the maze, you guys know, that uh, Dwayne Patterson, that Dwayne Patterson, where's my mind at, guys? I'm thinking, that you guys know what I'm thinking, but uh, Bigfoot reports in our area, July 2009, let me get a little bit more comfortable. So I can see this. It's like four pages. It's all good because these are uh, places that I've been 
researching for a lot of years, not as many years as Dwayne, but we've been doing this for a minute. And like I said, guys, let me know if you ever see anything back there. Leave it in the comments. Also, leave in the comments what you think about Dwayne Pintoff's story because it definitely is fascinating. I definitely find this story fascinating, all three parts. But uh, July of 2009, it says right off the bat, locations, location, location. But abandoned property along such and such road by such and such place. The property owner arrived at the property around 8.30 a.m. to feed stray cats. As she walked from the car to the open area, she n noticed movement off to her right. As she looked, she saw what was. Sh as she looked, she saw what she first thought was a large dog. She said she stood st still and quiet, watching. The creature suddenly looked at her direction and stood up, and ran up to the brush. Into the brush, she said that it ran faster than anything she had ever seen run as she was watching the young creature run on two legs a huge black haired creature stepped out from behind a massive growth of vines and blackberry bushes she said that this creature was enormous in size it moved slow but steady to its right it got caught up in the, the vines grunting and ripping at the vines she said it couldn't get through so it backed up and walked through the thicket ripping the branches and vines as it walked. She, she didn't know how tall it was, so we re, we attempted to recreate what she saw. Eric, who is six feet tall, stepped into the brush and immediately we re realized that the ground went down about two feet, almost hiding Eric behind the weeds. He wasn't visible behind the blackberry bushes when he walked over to where the creature got caught up in the thicket. We used a measuring stick to see if the witness could determine the height. As Eric raised the stick, he spotted a purple hydranium flower and said the top of his head brushed the flower as, his arm, as he turned around. When we measured, the flower was nine feet, two inches from the ground. That's big. That was a massive alpha male. You're right, it was. It's probably the same alpha male that I've seen. I think it's like 23-inch track. Enormous. August of 2009, Nikki, a bartender now in Emicola Woodlands, was driving it on Jamalsville Road. I know this, I know this incident. To Hopwood around 2.30 a.m. when she spotted a large mass ahead of her in the middle of the road as she got closer to the mass stood up and started walking away from her car in the middle of the road she had come to a stop when this happened she said that she watched it walk as if it didn't care about her she finally decided to drive around the creature as she came up beside the creature it leaned over and looked at her through the windshield she said that terrified her you know after that sighting uh, we went up there right after that sighting up Jamonsville and right on that off the side of that road Jamonsville it's a national historical site and uh, they cut down that whole side of that that mountain as, as to where this, they did the same thing when they came after when I had two Sasquatch push that tree over split me and Mike up and two of them came down and, and was making an attempt to get Mike. They did the same thing. They took and cut down all the trees and just left the trees laid. They didn't even use the trees. They just left them lay on the ground. So that's, uh, that's I think that's one of the cover-ups that they use after an incident happens with a human in Sasquatch. They just go and cut the trees down. I'm not sure if that pushes the Sasquatch out of the area or what, but that's one of the things that I noticed they do, they do to cover things up. <coughs> okay, August of, two August of 2009, Nikki, a, 
I've read, I just got done reading that one. Uh, September 2009, mother and daughter witnessed a massive hair covered bipedal creature cross. Across the natural gas line near Camp Carmel Church camp, the mother and daughter had a routine of driving the gas line to the gas line to watch the deer. On this Saturday evening, they were shocked to see this creature walk across the gas line into the woods. We believed that it was going to the woods to get to the elderberries that were ripe at the time. June 2010, abandoned property owners, July in 2009, report had another encounter. The property owners were cutting grass and weeds during the middle of the afternoon as one of the owners went to get hedge trimmers out of the back of the car. She spotted movement to her right. When she looked, she said that it looked like a chimpanzee standing and staring at her. Immediately, it turned and ran like a blur. I know that blur. Um, like a blur into the woods. The property owners called their brother and me to come investigate. We scoured the woods around the property, but could not find any evidence. In July of 2010, 14 year old boy was chased out of Dunbar Game Lands while riding his ATV. He reported the incident to be to the police who contacted Stan Gordon. Stan Gordon. The boy would not meet with researchers to return to the location for the fear of another encounter. He said that the creature almost grabbed him as he floored his ATV. He said he never looked back until he was clear of the woods. That encounter happened coming up out of the ravine he was on a uh, four-wheeler coming up on the, the, the creek, that old creek bed that I walked in and out of to get down into the ravine, into the maze area. But the, the boy was coming up out, climbing the mountainside. There's a lot of bulky rocks, but I guess it stepped out on him and chased him out. Uh, and he, it was hard on his tail. He never looked back. He just kept it going until he made it home. But that's a fascinating story, and I've had something similar to that. It wasn't, I had this bad feeling. I was down in there on a dirt bike with my son, Mike, and we wasn't even looking for Sasquatch. We were just out riding, spending time with each other. And uh, I went down through this, this mud puddle, and the mud puddle pretty much engulfed my entire bike all the way up to the gas tank. The water was, it just, my bike just dropped in there, and it was stuck. And while I was trying to gas it out, the chain popped and got snagged, and it was a mess. So me and Mike fought and, and wrestled this bike up out of the mud puddle. And we're standing there, and Mike's holding the bike up, and I'm, I got branches trying to break this chain free. It's stuck down in, inside the, in, in the, between the sprocket and the frame of the bike. And I'm trying to get the chain unstuck. And I, I, I'm hearing stuff like off to my, my right, up into the weeds. I'm hearing something moving in on me, and I got this bad feeling set in on me, like something bad is about to happen. I got to get on this bike, and I got to get my son out of here. I mean, it's like it, something's about to go down. I knew so I, I had to get it and get it going. And I know the fear, the fear that that boy is fear, feeling to get out of there. <clears throat> but uh, July 2010, I did a day investigation into the, into the night investigation. During the day, two of the researchers heard what sounded like something run away from their location. This is at the Bun Cave. All right? I had that same encounter like three or four different times. When you're walking up to it, on the backside of that Bun, the Bun Cave, something takes off down toward the left. It always goes in the same direction. It always makes the same bipedal sound crashing down through there, but you never ever get a sighting of it. I've had that same encounter a lot, a lot. But uh, they both said it, it was on the 
on two legs of somewhat heavy sounding and when running that same night about 10 of us gathered to do a night investigation we split up into three groups around 11:30, the four of us sitting along the ledge were ambushed by rocks being thrown one the size of my palm barely missed my head pouncing off the tree behind where i was sitting at, at the same time the group that had walked about 200 yards down the road were also ambushed with one of the guys was one of the guys getting hit in the chest with a medium-sized rock it was an eventful night at the same time all right let me picture this you got Dwayne and his group at the bunk cave and they start getting bombarded with these rocks and then about 200 yards down the road at um, Moy land he has a group at the exact same time get bombarded by rocks that's saying that there's more than one you got a whole tribe there just messing with you definitely okay August of 2010 a nurse driving home from work around midnight had a trail had a tall hair covered bipedal bipedal cross in front of her car as she drove along some roads. It came off of the hillside near some road and crossed over the guide rail and disappeared into the woods across Dunbar Creek heading toward the game lanes up to the area where we researched. September 2010, a father and son were driving along such and such road near the abandoned property near 9.30 p.m. Suddenly, a tall haired covered creature ran out of the woods left to right in front of their car. It quickly disappeared into the woods. We believe that it could have been catching frogs in the pond by the railroad tracks. February 2011, the abandoned property owners drove to their abandoned property after church. To check on the feed, to check on and feed the stray cats, as they were leaving, they noticed a movement to their left. They slowly, they slowed their car enough to see the tall, hair-covered creature run up to it, out of the spring-fed creek across the single-lane dirt road that was covered in snow and up the steep embarked embankment until it disappeared several of us came to the location within a couple of days we found large human shaped tracks in the snow this road is within 50 or so yards from where the father and son had the creature run in front of their car that's that same area they're having a lot of encounters there and that's where Dwayne believes that then is held up at on this private property up in there and that's probably going to be our next trip out. We wasn't able to make it on this last trip to the den because we covered so many different spots already and it was getting late. So we just, just decided to call it a day on that one. But we're definitely going to go back up and see if we can locate the den. Okay, March 2011. I took an ex-girlfriend to the game lands to do some footing, big footing. While there, we found what is now called the bun cave we did not enter the cave because i did not have a weapon and when i shined a flashlight at the entrance i am certain that i saw what looked like a huge pile of crap much larger than a human would do a week later i returned to the location with four other researchers and we entered the cave finding the complete bone remains of an adult deer there is no way that that deer could have walked or crawled into this cave and died. We determined that it most likely was drugged or carried by a large animal or Bigfoot. We removed all of the bones. I returned to the location within four weeks with another researcher. We entered the cave and were shocked to find the bone remains of another adult deer. Over the next two years, we found a total of four adult deer bun remains in this cave. In October 2011, we discovered that there was a lower cave at the back of this rock formation 
It is difficult to gain access, but once inside, we discover the burned remains of multiple animals scattered along. along the ground and setting on the ledges. It was like a scene from a horror movie. It really is. It's terrifying when you get in there. This is how the nickname Bone Cave started. November 2013. After a day of investigating the Bone Cave, Bone Cave area, my researcher friend and I decided to do some night investigation. We started at the Bone Cave, all quiet at midnight. We relocated to another location along that old dirt road. We sat there for over an hour. We decided to relocate the gas line. We decided to relocate to the gas line before calling it a night. We walked to the Dunbar Creek Overlook as it was quiet in the parking lot below and where we were standing. As we were standing there, we heard what sounded like ATVs or dirt bikes coming down that dirt road so I told Tom that I was going to put eyes on the Jeep to make sure the riders kept going. I walked about a 50, a 50 yards back toward the Jeep just over the rise. That's when Tom had his encounter. He said that he had he did a loud yell then snapped some branches. As soon as he did that he heard two loud wood knocks come out of the woods behind him. Unfortunately, he didn't hear that due to the wind was blowing the other direction. When I returned, Tom was standing, staring at the woods with his pistol in his hand. I asked if he saw anything, and he said no. I said, let's see if we can make it run by walking towards it. Tom insisted, but finally gave in. He Tom hesitated, but finally gave in. He stood at the edge of of the trees while I cautiously walked in about 30 or 40 feet. Almost immediately the rock throwing started. Powerful thrown rocks could be heard ricocheting off the trees from several feet deep into the woods. I jumped behind as a, I jumped behind a tree as two rocks landed close. Tom ducked behind a boulder. When things settled down I attempted to walk deeper and the rock throwing started again. This time we decided to leave before someone got hit. I returned to this location the next Saturday and found a new tree structure in the location from where I believed that the rocks were being thrown. As I surveyed the area, I had a near miss when a huge limb fell out of the tree that I just passed by it would have easily killed me had I had it landed on me that rattled me so I exited the woods and returned later with another researcher we stumbled across another cave during that field outing that had a bed of leaves piled into the flat boulder inside the cave and that's the end of that but that, that, I told you guys, it is a fascinating story. Very fascinating. It blew my mind. And, and th not just that, I've had the same experiences in the same area, same locations. So with two researchers going out there and having them kind of encounters, it speaks volumes. It's saying a lot. It's saying that there is something out there. There is something going on. And it's just not me. Um, making things up so to speak with that being said guys I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did Dwayne Pentoff is a va very fascinating individual I'm glad I got to experience his knowledge go out there and just learn what he knows some of the things that he knows and uh, share some of the experiences that we've had in them same locations with that being said I'm sure there's going to be a lot more outings with the wing. I'd, I'd like to get out there a lot more and check some things out and just get things done. But it's getting late, guys. I'm going to go ahead and get up and uh, eat some breakfast and get my shit together, get out there and hit the woods, see what I can run into, see what's going to happen next. Well, first, I'm going to upload this and then I'm going to get out. But 
stay tuned for this next crazy ass adventure, guys, because I'm still here. I'm just getting my back a little bit better. I feel all right. It still hurts a little bit, but I'm going to get up and get out there, guys. Stay tuned for this next crazy ass adventure.